Jasmine Perrin, Head of Human Factors and User Research at Proteus. And I lead the internal research methods, qualitative and quantitative, to design our product, and as well as to understand our market and what we're going after as a company. And I've been at Proteus for about a year and a half now, and prior to coming to Proteus, I had a, a background in design. So I worked in design consultancies for a decade and then uh, consumer products before that. So I brought with me a, a certain kind of perspective on product development, and it's really been a journey for me uh, to come and to work in-house, right, and to work at a company that's you know, a regulated medical product, and um, that experience has been um, a journey, as I mentioned, and I think there's a lot of opportunities in, in the space of trying to use methods that are um, in rapid iteration in a company that is regulated and has a lot of different constraints to work um, within. And so that's what I'll be talking about today. So to give you a little bit of background on what Proteus uh, creates, um, there's essentially a small ingestible sensor that's the size of a grain of sand. And uh, the, the sensor is embedded in medication. So essentially you can either take a placebo pill that incorporates the sensor inside of it, or um, what we're doing now is embedding it in different um, type of generic medications that are basically over-encapsulated. And then next we're developing our own digital medication, so it's going to be embedded in the medication directly. And it's part of a multi-touch point system. So just giving you a sense of how this works, it essentially, um, as I mentioned, the sensors in the medication that you swallow, and then you wear a patch. So there's a patch that's attached to your skin, and that patch can read the signal from the medicine. So it sounds out like a beacon, essentially, that's only interpreted by the patch, so it doesn't go out to everybody. <laughs> um, so you can, uh, the system can tell if it's you know, certain medication or a different medication, so there's some um, sort of stamping that goes on there, as well as what time it's taken. And then that patch then communicates to a, a mobile device or a, an application that um, look, you can look at patterns and see reports on the data, and then that's shared with a patient as well as a doctor. The patch can also track uh, activity patterns, so steps you take or um, rest patterns, so uh, you know how much you're um, spending lying down. Essentially, there's an accelerometer inside. Um, also, it can detect um, things like heart rate, and so we can get a sense of exertion um, for activity. So you can see it's, it's got multiple touch points, and that's one part of the system that's super interesting. Another part is the ecosystem of stakeholders. So this has been um, a really interesting um, problem for you to look at as a researcher and designer. It's really it's really challenging actually to. Uh, create a product that satisfies all these different stakeholders, right? This is part of the healthcare industry that's um, challenging and interesting for everybody. So just to walk you through some of the sort of the tensions here. Um, so how I'm looking at this here is there's four major stakeholder groups that we have to address. Um, we have the patient that we're designing for to use our system, which is in the top left-hand corner. There's the provider who's prescribing the product because it's a medical device, it's prescribed. You can't get this off the shelf. There's the person who's paying, like the customer, essentially, up on the right-hand corner. And then there's the manufacturer, that's Proteus at the bottom. So in the center you have, um, essentially, the, the, the needs that need to be targeted that satisfy all the different stakeholders. And so, for example, for the, the, the patient, if it's not comfortable as a physical product, you know, that's gonna be a problem, right? So it needs to be comfortable, it needs to address and uh, address their care situation. So it needs to be effective. And if it is um, too much of a hassle to wear or uncomfortable, that's a deal breaker, right? So it's, if the maintenance is too much of a problem or there's no benefit, that's it. The product fails. Um, so similarly for the, the prescriber, if they're not getting any insights from it, like it's not performing in terms of like the value for them, um, or it's too complicated, um, 
that's not going to deliver the positive, you know, so the deal breaker for them is really if it takes too much time for them to prescribe and figure it out, that's going to be a problem, right? So each of these has um, implications for what we're designing. And um, for example, with the payer that we're designing for, we have a certain patch that we um, design to last a certain period of time and um, certain robustness, right? So if it ends up costing more because there's some malfunctions or like people lose it or something, then that's going to be a deal breaker for the payer. So in overall, if it's not cost effective, if it's not cost viable, if there's not enough persistent users, that's a problem for Proteus. So this is like the, the challenge that we, we balance. We can't just design for cost, right? We have to design for all these different dimensions. So in this process, uh, what I've learned is that cross-pollinating the consumer world and the methods that I've brought from design into this clinical space is an area that's an opportunity to develop more because it's a challenge and it's also something that's growing even more um, now with mobile medical products. And I also wanted to point out the area that we're primarily focused on right now is diabetes and hypertension um, as a space. And so it's actually um, well fitting that it falls right after your <laughs> presentation. Um, so um, in, in that particular space, um, medication adherence drops off by 50% after the first year um, in general. And after the first month, it's um, the biggest drop off. So medication adherence um, in general is a big problem with chronic conditions. So this is a huge, a huge area of need um, for, for people to improve their adherence. It's something that's a big challenge and, and an opportunity. So call to action. Um, why is this happening now, right? Well, there's all this innovation that's occurring, right? So here's the, the Google Glass contact lens, you know, so it's an idea of intersecting the worlds together. Is it a consumer product or is it a medical device? You know, what about these apps? Are these consumer products or not? And actually, you know, patients don't know the difference. <laughs> so it, the, the onus is on um, the producer, actually, to make sure that you're not providing this information out there. There's a lot of responsibility that goes into this, even though it's not maybe clear all the rules to the, the end user. So, um, however, uh, these products are trying to influence behavior, right? And I'd say that that's the goal, usually, is you're providing, providing information to have an effect. So there is a responsibility there. And um, there's just a lot of debate right now about these products and, you know, should they be regulated? How do you regulate a mobile device, a um, mobile app um, in the medical space? Um, these are very different industries, right? So it's entirely one thing to walk up to a consumer product in the shelf, right, and buy that versus behind the glass, it, you know, you, you get prescribed, you wait in line, you have a, you know, a pharmacist explain it to you. Um, so it's a very different experience um, also from the, the purchaser side of it, or the, sorry, the patient side, the, the buyer. And actually, it's confusing when I even say the buyer or the patient, right, because um, of the complexity on the stakeholder side of things. So the two different industries, um, I'd say are kind of almost opposite in a lot of ways. <clears throat> so I'm not sure if you can read this, but um, so the consumer products are a self-directed purchase. You make the decision, you buy it, whereas medical devices are prescribed. Consumer products, the payer is the same as the end user, whereas medical devices, it's a separate stakeholder altogether. So the insurance company for example, or um, it's also in the case of like a health insurance system, it could be just like the, the health insurance system, the health system itself, so Sutter Health makes a decision about whether they have a certain uh, medical device in their health system, so they also make decisions that we're not aware of. So consumer products are a much more straightforward path, right, you uh, market online, you throw little venues for getting your product out there, whereas medical devices is this very interdependent ecosystem, which is represented by that clover diagram. Consumer products are lightning fast, right, very quick, relatively, and medical devices are just slow moving industries. Consumer products are partially regulated, so cell phones has some, they have some regulation regarding communications, but Relatively speaking, it's very different and much heavier in, in medical. 
And um, as we heard earlier, uh, there's a stigmatizing sense of having a chronic condition, right? Which is why uh, my diabetes secret is is very powerful, right? So how do you handle this? How do you create a product for something that's stigma, right? And so again, our product has a wearable, which is on the outside of the body, um, something we have to think about. We can't have people showing it off, right? Because that doesn't make sense in this context. Um, whereas a consumer product, you purchase it yourself, right? So it's an expression of your identity. And usually that's a, a positive. These um, very different industries collaborating together in the same product create a very different um, experience than one or the other, right? Because you have to work cross disciplinary, you work together, and you have different methods, right? So that's that was what struck me coming into the company is how how different. So um, you know, background in research and design, and, and and so we use methods where we're very creative. We create stimuli, we get um, user input, and what I learned is that um, there's this enormous uh, history in clinical research, right? So for me, this is again a learning um, that I had. So I'll just walk you through this at a very high level, but basically clinical research has just developed over time with, you know, originally with the scurvy, sailor scurvy, um, basically developing uh, experimentation with limes and different ships and ways of looking at uh, groups of people and trying different medicines. The FDA was formed because there are some drugs just changed chemical um, compound and became toxic, right? So there were no safety precautions in place. And so each of these um, iterations of development created more and more regulation, essentially, for clinical research. So there are so many rules that are involved in clinical research for a good reason, right? You don't want people experimenting on you, right? So today, there's a lot of uh, personal, uh, personalization and technology advancement because of the rules, because the rules keep people safe, and that's allowed a lot of growth. So, with in comparison, product design is very recent. Um, you know, really, industrial design came about in the nineteen thirties. So, um, the the field is just very, very different length of time in terms of maturity, right? So, um, the product design methods and research methods that I've been trained in. Um, are uh, not as um, much have a different character to them. That's it. And what I've also learned is that design problems are changing significantly. Right? We have the D school right now. We have social innovation. We're trying to have, you know change behavior. We're trying to do all of these things that are social problems. So we're applying design to social problems now, and that requires a whole new set of of methods, which we learn in places like the D school. We learn how to collaborate. We learn how to brainstorm and come up with new innovation. And then lastly, I was going to point out how um, medical device regulation actually and methods are um, very recent as well. So um, while we, you know, we, when you work in this industry, you don't realize sometimes how mature some of the, the vectors are of the processes that you're using. And um, I learned that so the medical device and the, the human factors requirements and whatnot are fairly recent as well. So this is interesting because basically the work that we're doing is, is at this cutting edge. Essentially, it's a combination of personalization of medicine, you know, understanding the user, how are they, a patient, how are they, um, how are they uh, responding to medicine, social problems, looking at diabetes, and, and how, are we, how are we addressing that, and how are we changing um, behavior, and then also this regulator, regulatory gray area of mobile health, which is also um, on the edge. So these, this new paradigm shift is occurring where all these um, different uh, industries are coming together in this one area, product area, which makes it really interesting. It also makes it really uh, dynamic and, and challenging, right? So the methods that I'm mentioning that I'm using in my work are really at opposite ends of the spectrum, and that creates a sort of um, area to innovate in. So. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Jan Chip Chase. He's um, somebody I used to work with at Frog Design a while back, and he's a like the Indiana Jones of design research. <laughs> so he goes to um, like Africa, and is, I mean, he's just a really interesting guy. You should check it out. He's um, he he's heavily based on photography, and it's all about understanding people and their context and 
getting to know um, how different cultures are similar in really unseen ways, and it's about empathy, and it's about discovery, and it's, it's really exciting. And in this context, um, the camera can be like a gun, right? It can be really risky. So if you're in Afghanistan and you're photographing somebody and you shouldn't be talking to them and the, cam the photograph is out, right? That breach of privacy essentially could be really deadly. So um, part of the work that he does, which is really exciting, is pushing this edge and figuring out where is that edge, especially in you know developing countries. Like, what can you cannot, or can you or cannot you not do, right? What what are the limits? What are the boundaries? And so this is in, in design in research or in design consultancies. This is oftentimes like one uh, example of kind of the, the edge, the border of how you discover your um, your target user, how you understand them, where you get information, and where you get inspiration. In contrast, in the clinical um, the cl clinical world. There, since it's been around so long, there's just a lot of committees and rules and ethics that go involved. It's a, the experience is more like um, what you see here. You're really pouring over the details and you're really understanding uh, the limits. And it's about understanding the written word, right? Because it's been written down. It's really clear in writing if you just spend the time to read it and discuss it and understand it. So it's a very, very different culture. So. My experience coming into the uh, medical device industry has been one where the, these methods are at opposite ends of the spectrum. So we have, so the first one was um, design research is generative. It's about inspiring, informing, you know, being creative, whereas clinical research is more evaluative. You have a very specific question you're trying to answer and you come up with the answer. So design research is also empathetic. It's about going to Afghanistan and connecting with that person, right? Communicating that story out you know, sharing that empathy. Clinical research is about very prescriptive steps so that anybody can conduct the research, essentially, and it can be repeatable. Design research is much more adaptive, right? So if you go um, on location and you have a design you bring with you and you realize it's not working, you can actually change the method and get the answers that you need to get by changing the method, and that's okay, because you're trying to get an answer and feedback about certain contexts and users. Whereas clinical research is highly systematic, you cannot change midway. I mean, you can cancel a study you do, you can cancel a clinical trial, but you can't um, improvise along the way. <laughs> it's just not the kind of, it's not led, um, not um, allowing the constraints on allow that. So design research is very personal, as I mentioned, whereas clinical research is double blind, right? You don't know who um, the data is coming from, you can't, you know, usually know their names, that sort of thing. So it's, again, very different and opposite from design research. So, given these are so different, what happens when you mix them together? So, <laughs> this is an opportunity, right? It's, um, <coughs> it's a, a new, it, something that's happening more and more now with these companies and the, the industry is moving towards these hybrid type of products, right? And and the industries and the people who are making those products really have to contend with both ends of the spectrum. So what I've done is I've collected some best practices and ways of thinking about um, how, how we do this work. And so really, I think of it as charting new territory best done from using the best practices of each, right? So it's not reinventing the wheel, it's taking the best of both and you create this new other discipline. So, you know, the camping in a cave. <laughs> basically. And the ingredients for this really are um, several. Defining boundaries, stretching what you know, collaborating with others, creating umbrellas, and then knowing your constraints. So for the boundaries, I've had um, so many uh, different meetings with our groups internally, and it's understanding where are these boundaries. Can you take photos when you do a study that's clinical? Can you know their names? Can you use that information in a presentation? Can you um, analyze it? Or what, what, what are the boundaries here? I mean, it's medical, you can't do a lot of these things, right? So it's, it's understanding how far can you push. And also knowing where you should um, hold the line even if you want to have access. Or like you have to also have ethical standards as well that you impose, because sometimes in these circumstances, you'll see examples later, but you, um, we have ethical standards that we have to uphold because um, we're charting new territory, right? So we're making up 
studies and different methods and need to apply those best practices ourselves. Stretching. <clears throat> so this is one that actually that um, when I present this uh, presentation to clinical people from the clinical side, they relate to this point the most. <laughs> so if you're on the clinical side and you're used to reading the rules and knowing them and doing things by the book, this is working with design researchers is really tough, right? Because we're constantly like, contorting them and trying to push the boundary and see what we can collect. And, and so it's really about, um, for us, but for them as well, getting them on board and having them know that this is not business as usual. <coughs> Collaborating is key. So we've created a lot of innovative methods internally because we've been able to collaborate on the study design. It's not just owned by one department. It's also you know shared cross-functionally. Umbrellas, so if you're ever in the process of doing these clinical studies, it's, there's a strategy involved in creating these umbrellas. And that allows for iteration quicker. I don't know how many of you, so let me ask, how many of you are familiar with the IRB submission process or any of this for clinical? Okay, a few of you, yeah. So this is a very time intensive process, um, which was, again, one of these things to get my head wrapped around as a design researcher coming in rapidly iterating on things. Um, if you want to do a clinical study, it usually takes you know at least a couple of months to get approval to do the study. So it's not something you can iterate on very easily on the fly. And that time frame, which is about those boards, the committees reviewing what your proposals are, um, can be really challenging for innovation, right? Because by the time you get the study approved, you've totally moved on to a different design. So how do you handle that tension of time frame? It's really, really tricky. So one way of doing that is coming up with these umbrellas. So you've gotten the, you have the master protocol approved, essentially, and you, you submit smaller studies, right, within that. So it's a way to think uh, strategically. And then lastly, working within the constraints. And actually, as a designer, that's what it's all about, is really understanding constraints and working within them. So um, usually, this once you kind of push, push, and you figure out where the lines are, understanding those constraints and just accepting them, and then building upon them. It's actually a very creative experience. So <clears throat> this is really uh, showing the way for a new discipline. And this is probably pretty faint to see, but essentially, this is a simplified design process. So in the very beginning, basically, you see the fan um, you know, converge and diverge, and then you iterate through a development process, right? And um, in the design process I'm used to working on is usually the, the, the beginning part, where it's you, you narrow in on the design problem, you go broad, and then you iterate. So in um, clinical world, or when you're working in a medical device company, you have that part too, and then you have to freeze, right? And then you're working towards your evidence building, because for you to get um, your 510K submission for your device development, you have to have evidence to show that it works. So at some point you just stop, you freeze, basically, what you're working with. And again, what do you do then? How do you iterate? Is it a done process? Or what do you do with that constraint? So again, if you overlay on top of that design research and clinical research, you, you basically um, are working at different ends of the spectrum. And each of those have those different techniques. So what we've done is we've developed different methods that overlap the two uh, best practices and two cultures, essentially, um, and work in the middle here. So the first study method, and I want to talk about just two different examples here. Um, it's RCS, that's our abbreviation for it, um, which is more about kind of the engineering prototyping type of um, research method. And then there's CLUE, which is more similar to like uh, ethnography. So RCS studies, this is one um, where essentially, you know, regular consumer products, you want to prototype different devices, right? This is, for example, Wearables. So it could be, you could be prototyping screens, you could be prototyping whatever it is you want to prototype. But um, actually this itself is a clinical study. What I've learned is you can't put anything on the body at all that isn't, um, if it's part of a study, if it's a medical device, basically that's a line you can't cross. So as a designer or researcher, that becomes really hard to, to iterate on at the prototype level, right, if you can't do this. So this method really was designed in order to help get around this particular stays on the body the longest. So if you're making a patch and you want to wear it, what stays on the body? What feels most comfortable? Uh, how does that experience change over time? 
So those are pretty kind of basic questions that um, anybody who's developing a wearable would want to ask. However, as I mentioned, anything stuck on the body needs that approval from the IRB. So we're now crossing into the clinical world. And there's also no replacement for human living skin. So <laughs> we've tried to create different machines, and we have some that can act like a skin, you know, and you can try um, wearing, putting a patch on it and seeing how long it will stay on, right? Um, but it really isn't the same thing. So um, this we found is a, a limit for us. So we've had to develop this method where we could, in fact, um, test things on the body. And this is basic um, prototyping and evaluation, but it's a clinical study. And we've been able to do it in a way that's rapid because we're using that umbrella protocol. And so if you compare this to other types of testing, so user preference testing, um, and clinical research. It's, it's something in, in, in the middle, basically. And one reason we're able to get around this, and I hope it's not too too, um, too regulatory <laughs> to talk about this, but basically it means that we, um, because it's R&D focused, it's just research and, you know, we're prototyping, we're iterating fast. This isn't, this information is not used in our filings. So it's not used for the FDA submission process um, intentionally, because we want to be able to have that freedom to just Explore and so this was um, a very innovative way to create an umbrella that allowed us to do that exploration with clinical product. So the other um, study that's actually quite innovative in this space is clue studies. We call them clinical user experience. So for any of you who have done ethnography or in-home research, um, you know it's a very common practice to understand your users on location, right? So go wherever they're using your product and understand what the environment is like. And again, if you're, if we have a device, um, we, you know, in the consumer world, you have uh, beta studies, right? Beta, you can do a beta trial. You can, you know, if you're Facebook, you can just create a new feature and launch it and see what happens, right? You can't do that with a medical device, right? You can't experiment like that um, without running a clinical trial. So this is a way for us to get uh, quickly, um, sorry, uh, quick market feedback by trying out using a beta product, but it's a clinical trial in this um, sort of hybrid fashion. It's hybrid for a few reasons. One is we're using photographs. So this is from the study, right? Um, and understanding how people are using it in the wild. So that's something that isn't done normally. If you think back to the double blind studies, you don't know anybody's name, you don't know what they look like. Um, and here we're going to people's homes and using a clinical uh, product that's in development and getting feedback on it. So this is the only way for us to get input on how, how a product really uses, how a product really works in the wild um, when it's in development and has not been approved yet. If you think about other products that are medical devices, how do they do this, right? How do they get approval? Well, they usually run clinical studies, like full clinical studies, um, which are very, very expensive. So what this is doing differently is this is a, a technically clinical, but it's much more of a hybrid version. It's much more nimble than a traditional <coughs> clinical study would be. Um, but it is still on the clinical side of things, so it is still very quite, quite expensive relative to traditional ethnography would be. So we are able to do things like understand frustration with the onboarding experience, what pe people think when they click the green light, what does that mean? Um, and then you hear about their stories, right, about their slinky black dress and how they're worried about people seeing their, their, their patch underneath. And these are things we wouldn't get at otherwise um, if we were doing a, a traditional clinical study. And um, they're key, really important info, you know, insights for product development. We're also able to understand the highs and the lows and sort of the emotional experience from looking across a uh, product and how it's used. And what this does is it gives you insight, which is key. Um, and that's one thing that I think is really important for any kind of the innovation process, right, is having some insight into your end users, whether it's coming from yourself and your own experience or other real users, right? Um, that the insight is um, kind of the gold nuggets that you look for to, to really, um, do something different and innovative. So this study is um, one that's close, most similar to ethnography, but it's um, 
but it still is a clinical study, technically speaking, and this information is used for our filings. It's not R&D anymore, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, the product is fixed, and so that's, um, it's a little bit farther along the development process. I showed you two different points in time, and this is farther down. So, essentially, what I just showed you is a way of integrating this concept of insight and the concept of evidence building together. So it's a hybrid approach to tackling these issues by connecting them together rather than having them be completely separate types of work. Um, we're integrating them. And we're doing this to stay ahead of the curve, right? I mean, we can't have a, release a product at the pace of a traditional medical device. Um, <coughs> we want, we have a software app. We, software um, changes quite often and people's expectations change rapidly. So um, basically, we need to be able to combine the best of both worlds together to release this product that is both medical and consumer at the same time. And this also means there's a responsibility we have to think ahead and think of what problems could occur. We can't push boundaries too far because we don't want to hurt people, right? We still are in the medical world and we want to be very careful. So it's about thinking ahead and learning from the best practices and experiences of those other fields that we're working with collaboratively. And then seeing what the opportunity is here because there are a lot of challenges, right? So it's how do you work within those constraints and see the positive? And with that, I just want to say, um, you know, this is an area I'm interested in in terms of innovating in practice and new, what are methods that people come up with. So if anybody here is interested in this as well, I'd love to talk to you further about this or just the product in general. And with that, thank you. Are you going to be my runner? <laughs> questions? Okay. <laughs> so I don't know if anybody has any questions about um, the product or something. Short question. Uh, I actually come from the kind of the regulatory quality side. Okay. But uh, have you guys ever thought about using um, like animal studies, like preclinical stuff, um, before you do any like first in man kind of trials? So I know that um, there have been a lot of studies on animals um, for the IEM, for the part that you swallow. Um, so I think that was a big part of their process early on. Prodesis has been around for actually about 10 years. And so they've used a lot of uh, earlier methods um, for that portion. So when I came along, that part was already established and approved by the FDA. And so the part I've been working on is more, more the wearables or the app part of it. Um, and we have not tried that, like, because of the app wearability. I mean, it's about comfort, and skin is so specific to humans, right? It's <laughs> for, you know, yeah, but it's a, it's a, it's a really good point. Hi, a bit, very uh, interesting talk. If um, regulatory and legal constraints are as bad as I think they are, at least in the States, um, why not do your research elsewhere mm. and then bring your, bring your findings across mm. and um, do all the clinical stuff that's needed as per regulation? Mm. Um, it's an interesting idea. I think in some ways, that's what Jan Chipchase, the, the photographer, researcher, Indiana Jones, is doing, right? He's going to Africa or Afghanistan where there aren't as many rules and pushing the boundaries there and then we're bringing it back and seeing what does it mean. Um, but I mean, that's an ethical problem, right? Um, I suppose you can have, I mean, medical in the other developing countries, I mean, it seems like that would be a whole other level <laughs> of um, what is a what is good practice. Um, yeah, I can't imagine. Uh, I know certainly the culture isn't one that would even talk about that. It's an interesting idea, for sure. I know at um, in other previous projects I've worked on uh, when I was doing consulting, like the idea of going to Africa and working on mobile apps for you know AIDS dissemination or the information around AIDS or pregnant ladies who you know need help in certain ways. And, um, is a great place to do it, right? Because um, it's medical information. You're not really, um, you're helping, you know, improving things. You're not really risking um, risking um, things too much. But 
yeah, it's not something that we <laughs> think about doing. It's a good, good question. Thank you. That was great. Um, I've had a bit of I have a background in industrial design, but also engineering, and I work in medical devices. And I find a lot of the issue when you're working in big teams is getting everyone else on board with the value of doing this. Because a lot of times they just want to get something that works. So I've worked on a lot of projects where like it works, it's great, we'll lock it, good to go. And now that it's tough to describe the tangible benefits of doing this iterative research, yeah. you know, beyond the function of doing an injection. It's the is the injector, can they hold it? Where do they hold it? How long do they keep it on their body? Where and all that they don't think there's any benefit to that, just as long as they can put the drug in the body, good, done. And right. so I find I would be curious to know how you yeah. deal with that because, like you said, the industry is well established, and there's this mindset of risk avoidance because it is very risky. Right. So, so you can talk about that. Yeah, having good stories about why things have failed in the past, either at that company or elsewhere, things we've tried and what doesn't work um, helps a lot. Um, certainly, everybody knows the like. If you go back to that clover diagram. In the center, it has to work for patients to feel, and they have to feel comfortable, right? So looking at the priorities across stakeholders also helps ground it because it's not just about cost, right, for example, or just about, just about safety, right? If it's really uncomfortable, that's a deal breaker. So it is looking at all the dimensions and trying to articulate that. But it, it's a huge area because um, I think that's one, one challenge. Um, you know, someone asked me earlier today, what what's, like, why did you, what attracted you to Proteus? And, what are some of the challenges? And I'd say, actually, like communicating across um, disciplines is really, really hard. Um, and actually, my previous life, I worked in mobile, right, and hardware and software, and that's different, right? But this is a whole other level, right? It's medical and clinical and designing, you know, <laughs> very, very, very different cultures and regulatory, you know. And so, um, it is about talking about the vision and the higher level picture and the dimensions of it. I'd say to best to communicate. I'm just curious about the scope of services of Proteus. Mm -hmm. We've been talking pretty much tonight, the way I understand it, is the injectable. However, does the company provide a broad range of design research services for any number of needs that the community might mm -hmm. have? Mm -hmm. And uh, has the company worked in even though you mentioned the African villages, have they gone to the villages of downtown Detroit and underprivileged neighborhoods in, in this country? And would that fit in your business model? Okay, I just want to clarify a few things. So, so there's an ingestible, but it's not injectable. So, um, and um, in the villages, <laughs> I brought up that Jan Schiffer's example because he is a former colleague who. Who worked in he worked at Nokia and in the mobile phone industry and design. So he's sort of um, an example from the design industry. But he's not. Um, nor the project I mentioned earlier. That's something that, that I worked on in in the design context. So not something that Proteus does. Um, so, and Proteus in terms of it doesn't really offer services like as in we'll go and help understand like a service offering. Um, but the, to answer your question, what what kind of areas does Proteus work in? Um, works in uh, work in diabetes. That's the current focus: uh, diabetes, hypertension, basically cardiometabolic conditions. Um, that's one one area. Another area I previously worked in is um, Alzheimer's cognition. Um, you know, people that sort of a caregiving model where you have somebody that need, you need to monitor from. Um, your home, maybe you want to monitor your parents, and are they taking their medicine? Kind of. Um, and we've moved away from that more so to this other area right now. Um, and then there's uh, we have partners who are working in mental health, schizophrenia, bipolar, and that's a whole other area and use case. And why would somebody be using um, a product like ours? So we'll partner with them. Um, and then there are other. Uh, types of medicine areas that we're looking into. Um, so basically how this works is there's a panel, we have a panel of medicine. So for diabetes, there's a panel of six medicines that we're using. And then um, we uh, work with partners in the UK, for example, or here, um, and then offer our, our product, or sell our product essentially into their healthcare system and then help them manage their patient population and reduce their costs overall. 
So I hope that answers your question. So thank you for the talk. I um, just had a quick question. Your goal is to improve um, medication uh, medical, medication adherence, right? right. So can you tell us a little bit more about mm -hmm. like what the experience is and how you kind of have met that? Like how has like it, how, how has bringing that solution <coughs> of ingestible um, improve the, the medication adherence for that patient and how the doctor maybe monitors that? Yeah. So medication adherence is a big, a, big, a huge goal, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, the statistics, statistics are really amazing if you think about the problem today of 50% of people who, with chronic conditions stop taking their medicine, right, after a year. Um, so. Um, we've done various studies that have looked in these different populations and um, have seen different types of things that are compelling. I guess I don't have the, the evidence and numbers for you to say like improvement um, efficacy numbers, but I'm sure on the website uh, we'll have papers that talk about that. Um, so uh, what the experience is like, like how um, how, why would a person be using the product, for example? Is that what you're asking? Um, okay. Um, give some examples. Um, so, for example, we did a study looking at mental health, right, and schizophrenia and bipolar. And for a patient population like that, um, they find a product like this really uh, compelling because it documents whether they to take their medicine or not, right? So in that population, it can be very uh, scary if you have a problem because immediately your family members and doctors say, have you been taking your medicine or not, right? So if they have proof they've been taking their medicine, then they can get help for the actual problem they have, let's say, if it's not that. So it helps, um, for them it's more of an empowering, independent type of experience. Um, and then sort of in the diabetes area, the chronic condition space, um, some examples of how this helps adherence is that people um, sometimes don't know if the medicine is working for them, right? So they're taking medicine, but they don't know if it's effective. So um, by tracking medicine even for a short period of time and seeing if there's a, a benefit or not, um, that can be a better conversation with your doctor, right? Because you have some uh, information you can share. Look, I've been taking my medicine, I've been doing the exercise that I've been told to do, and it's, I've seen no difference in my health. So let's talk about, you know, changing the medicine or titrating it down. So those are some examples. So you can see how each discipline, each, sorry, each um, cohort uh, would have different reasons why they would want to be using a system like ours. I have one question for you. I want to ask you a question. So you mentioned I, this is as a medicine X thing. I can't let you out of here without asking about the patient perspective. You mentioned some of the sort of user feedback throughout the design process after you already have like a product in place. Like, how are they feeling about you know this is wearing a day to day? Do the patients or consumers factor into the design process before you actually have something to put into their hands? So, so we do research looking at the market or market needs before we get product into their hands. So understanding, um, we go to forums and understand some of the, so the patient experience from that perspective, understand um, the workflow involved in the healthcare system. So they're also an important stakeholder, some of the Cloverleaf stakeholders. Um, but for the patient, so what are all the ways we get input? We get input um, also from early prototyping. So it's not really um, putting a product into their hand necessarily. It's putting a something into their hands. It could be like a design, a comp, or just a patch to try and, you know, give us some feedback on that. So we try to do that as much as possible, early as possible, right? Because uh, in the design process, it's, you always want to fail, fail fast, right? <laughs> and get that input soon. So um, we definitely do, do that different ways. Yeah. Thank you, Sweet. <laughs>